Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Code Brown Loser. I hope you're doing well. So, folks, hope everybody's on pills. I know I am. Today, we're going to talk about the interrogations of Alec Murdoch. He does two questionings and then more of a formal interrogation. The first questioning is the night he killed his family, four hours after he did it, Three hours after he dialed 911, it's one in the morning. Everybody's hot and sweaty and tired. They're out on the dark, isolated Moselle property. Everybody piles into a car. There's a camera up in the corner. You can tell by just looking at it, it is a hot, sweaty butt fest in that car. Woo! Alex got a big old cha tobacco in. I'm sure he took a handful of pills. He's got the nicotine and the opiates working together. And for a lot of it, it looks like he feels great. He's doing his head nod thing. He's vibing. And of course, he's got to put on a show to try to look realistically distraught and sad as anybody would that just had their family murdered and didn't have anything to do with it. And so he turns on the crying, he'll go, <laughs> and he'll come down here outside of the camera's view and he'll hang out down here for a little bit and everybody puts a soothing hand on his back. There, there, Alec, there, there. And he'll come back up and he'll wipe his eyes with his Kleenex and his snotty nose. And then he wipes his glasses lenses with the same Kleenex. Like, did you just wipe your glasses with your snotty Kleenex? Why wouldn't you just use your cotton t-shirt that we know is clean that you just changed into? Is it because your Kleenex is dry because you're not crying? And just like everybody that tries to pretend to be realistically sad and distraught, they end up really turning it on at the beginning. I gotta make this look realistic. But then slowly it fades away because it's hard to keep up that performance. All of a sudden you're trying to get your story to sound realistic and the crying show floats to the back of your mind. And so at the beginning, he's really crying and carrying on. During the middle, he's vibing on the nicotine and opiates. And then as the thing, the questioning is, starts to come to an end, everybody realizes, oh my gosh, I haven't been crying quite enough. Realistically, I better really turn it on at the end. So you always get the beginning and then the middle, it sort of fades away. And then at the end, they turn it on again. If Alec, if this was video games and Alec off to the left had a power, authority, and benefit of the doubt gauge, these first two questionings, the gauge is totally full. Alec has the confidence. I'm a Murdoch. And the interrogator even starts out by saying, I hate to have to do this. And Alec hits him with the tone of, no, you don't you don't even worry about it sport i know i'm the boss of this town I, I, I know you got your little job and you got to ask your little questions but this is all just procedural <laughs> there's no way i'm gonna get in trouble so do you just go ahead and ask your little questions and you don't have any trouble with it and the interrogator's bald but i feel like if he did have hair alec would have tussled it no you don't worry about it sport you just ask your little questions and what's interesting about these questionings is by going off of what alec says and when he says it you can easily follow his thought process and in a roundabout way see his whole plan for trying to pull this off because when law enforcement show up to a scene like this it's a blank canvas and then with the evidence and with the testimony of witnesses slowly but surely on the canvas the picture is painted but alex furiously and desperately wants to paint the picture as quickly as possible, get himself crossed off the suspect list, get the whole thing kicked down the road in the right direction. And But what because of that, you end up jumping the gun a little bit and 
almost too urgently trying to get the story going where it's not realistic anymore. Like I was curious, what's the first thing that he said to the law enforcement when they showed up? And then what's the first thing he said in the interrogation? Because you could probably think that to him, whatever he wants to say first and get that going is very important to the direction he wants to push it and so when lon the first policeman gets there he's got his body cam going what's going on here alec the first thing he says is it was a long. it's a long story there was a boat wreck which is an interesting thing to say when two people are found shot to death on dry land and there's not even a boat around I mean, imagine thinking about, think about that. You're the cop that shows up. What happened? There was a boat wreck. It's like, Alec, I think you're rushing the fake story a little bit. Slow play it. Say you don't know. Say, come on, come over and help my son. And then slip in the fake story here and there, just right off the bat. He couldn't help himself. There was a boat wreck. That's what happened. Definitely the boat wreck. And then once the they get... Through the pleasantries in the interrogation, the interrogator goes, that night it's one in the morning, they're in the car, the interrogator's all right. goes, all right, start at the top, take your time. What he decides to say first is, um, like when I came back, that's where you start, you, like when I came back, to hopefully set in stone as an absolute, I was not here. Because those are the two really important parts of his plan, Right. Because if you don't establish there was a boat wreck and everybody hates my awful son because of the boat wreck and two vigilantes must have come and killed him before the boat wreck. If you don't quickly establish who else could have done it, come on this dark isolated property and done it, then all you have is a dead family and the father standing there with wild eyes ranting about a boat wreck. So it's very quickly to get that part of the story painted quickly there was a boat wreck vigilantes came you know how it goes with the vigilantes and the boat wrecks it's just that's a given and then once the the interrogation's going all right start at the top it's very the next incredibly important thing is i was not here you mean when i came back did i mention that i came back did i mentioned i wasn't here and i came back please for the love of god can we just have it set in stone that i came back but i want to start with going over alex's plan because he's not as smooth as he thinks he is and you can sort of see by the picture he's hoping to paint, he really doesn't want to spend the rest of his life in the concrete fart hole. And so he has a lot of skin in the game to try to get this investigation going away from him. And by doing that, you get to see his plan. And what's interesting about his plan, more than maybe it's just some other person that does something like this is he comes from this legal dynasty family where their whole family legacy and life's work is winning cases and prosecuting cases and what it takes to win a case and what it takes to pull out a case if you don't have the evidence and they all looked at each other as we have the gift of gab and we can bullshit people and they probably sat around fireplaces at hunting lodges talking about cases they won and how they pulled it out. And so this is not just some guy that kills his family. This is a guy that has prosecuted cases, that knows what it takes to win a case. He's delivered closing arguments in cases. So this is a educated plan to pull it off. So let's go over his plan. I said it last video, and I think... I think it supports what I said in the last video by how the first thing he said to the first cop, there was a boat wreck. Yeah, but we're on dry land. There's not even a boat around. Yeah, well, it was a boat wreck. And so I think that's the first time when after the boat wreck, Paul's social standing felt in the toilet. His great girlfriend dumped him. His two friends, really good buddies, don't want to hang out with him anymore. The, everybody around town, Paul kind of sucks. And then it even outside of the town became a national. And for the first time, I think Alec thought, huh. And it, 
it's creepy to think of Alec driving home, thinking about the plan, sitting on the toilet, in the shower, sitting at his desk at work, in between working on motions, coming up with the plan. Because there's a lot of choices that he made. And I think that's the first one is, okay, I've, there's, it's realistic, a little bit realistic that someone else, a vigilante, would do this. Because if you don't have that, it's just a guy standing around his dead family going, Ew. So I think it started with that. And then I think the next thing he probably decided was, okay, I'm definitely going to shoot him. And then the choices that he had once he decides, all right, I'm going to shoot him, or I can use family guns, that's the term, can use guns that we own, or I could buy an illegal gun that's not, um, can't be traced to my family at all. He went, I think, with family guns because if you buy another gun that's not connected to your family, all of a sudden the person you bought it from, if they get caught for something else or they're in jail for something else or who knows, all of a sudden they could start talking. Yeah, I sold Alec a gun two months before his family died, the same type of gun that was used. And that's unacceptable, having someone else know. And so I think he decided, all right, I'm going to use family guns, which was the, it really was the weakest part of his story. I don't think he thought in a million years that they would actually match shell casings of the exact gun to the property. I think he was thinking the most that I'll have to deal with is that the gun that was used is coincidentally, which is the first thing in this investigation, if you were the homicide detective, that would perk your ears up, which happens in the second questioning. That night at one in the morning, none, none of the investigation is done yet. None of the evidence is done yet. And then three days later, they do another questioning in the car, hot summer day. Everybody piles back in the car. And what's come out in those three days is the type of bullet that was used. And that, it's a little bit too much of a coincidence, but it's the same gun that... Out of 25, 30 guns that the Murdochs own, it's the one that maybe was stolen, but I'm not convinced. Or maybe it was lost, but maybe it was stolen. Or maybe it was out at the kennels. I don't know. And it gets a little bit unbelievable. Maybe it was stolen. Maybe it was lost. Maybe space aliens came down and shined the light beam on it. And the 300 blackout floated up into the mothership and blasted off into the cosmos. Because... What Alec wants, the picture he wants to paint is that two people that saw a privileged, drunk, brooding Paul kill the innocent Mallory Beach on the boat and they thought this will not stand so they snuck onto the property to kill them. But that starts to, that's what he really desperately wants. But that starts to fall apart once the, as the gun starts getting more connected to the property and the family. And then all of a sudden, by the third interrogation, they're already using the term family guns and saying, this is the gun. We matched the shell casings. It, it's hard because the story that he wanted everybody to go with was that two people randomly came on the property, killed them, and left. But now they're like, Alec, These, th it was that gun that you maybe lost or maybe got stolen or maybe it was space aliens. And so it gets pretty unbelievable because now, and at the trial, the defense ballistic expert made the argument that the two vigilantes were both five foot two. So the story then becomes that two five foot two vigilantes came on the property to kill Paul, but once the gun evidence came out and they could prove it's family guns, then you have to go with, okay, two five foot two vigilantes came on the property to kill Paul. They didn't bring their own guns and they luckily found the guns on the property that was really convenient and lucky to find them and they had bullets in them and they were ready to go and then they murdered them. And so in that third interrogation, they're talking about, 
well, maybe the gun were in Paul's car and they showed up and got him out of Paul's car. Or in this, or in the second interrogation, he's going, was there a ch- was, did you guys ever store any guns down at the kennel? And Alec goes, no, we didn't store them there, but sometimes guns were left there, hoping to make it sound realistic that when the five foot two vigilante showed up, there's possibly the gun that our family lost or maybe got stolen or who knows. Maybe it was out there and they just found it, which it's not believable to think that two five foot two vigilantes are going to plan to come kill Paul and not bring their own guns and just hope with two extremely crossed fingers. I hope that we find guns there. Imagine across town in the five foot two vigilante assassin hideouts when they're planning to come kill Paul and one of them is going, okay, so we're going to pull this off. Okay, we're going to go onto the Moselle property and we're going to do this, but we're not going to bring our own guns. We're going to hope with all of our might that once we get there, we find their guns and everything works out. And then the other five foot two vigilante would go, what do you mean we're going to hopefully we're fine guns that's a nightmare we're probably going to get shot and killed ourselves what are the chances that we actually just show up on this dark property that's huge and end up finding two guns to pull this off well we have to believe we can do it imagine being stalked by five foot two vigilante assassins everywhere you go the gas station the grocery store, there's an odd number of five foot two people staring at you with slanted eyes. And then when you make contact with them, with make eye contact with them, they scuttle off. And so Alex gun he the part of the plan about the guns is the weakest by far about his plan because he used family guns, I think thinking there's no way they're gonna find spent shell casings around the property and with hard evidence, connect them to family guns. I think he thought probably the most I'll have to deal with is an, a suspicious coincidence that, hey, Alec, the same gun that was used to kill your wife is also the same gun that happened to be lost or stolen or you don't really know. That's a little, as a homicide detective, you got to, understand that perks my ears up i think that's the most he thought that he'd have to deal with and then once they nailed down the actual shell casing that made his story of two random five foot two vigilantes coming to finish the paul job a little bit unbelievable but he decides all right i'm gonna shoot him of course where am i gonna do it Moselle, it's perfect there's no witnesses in sight if somebody far off hears a gunshot They're not going to think anything of it. It's big enough to where there's multiple locations. So the next part after he decided Moselle is he probably decided, okay, Maggie goes to the kennels almost every night. And, you know, Paul goes with her. They let the dogs run. That's perfect because if he does it at the house, all their cell phones and everything are at the house. He's at the house. He's immediately, Alec, that was you. You're there. So what he can do is make it look like he's at the house, leave his cell phone at the house, make sure not to drive a a vehicle that has electronic data, wait for them to be at the kennels. And so a choice that he made either on the toilet or in the shower or driving when he's planning to kill his family, another choice that he made is, okay, I'll wait for them to go to the kennels and then I can curate the electronic data by leaving my phone at the house driving the golf cart which there's an interesting moment in the interrogations where they ask how does uh, maggie get up to the kennels and he lists every possible way a buggy a vehicle you know and but he won't say golf cart he does not want to he can't even say it he does not want to introduce the way that he went down there So he's naming every way to get down to the kennels other than probably the way they would have done it, which is just the golf cart. So he's going, maybe a buggy or a vehicle or a unicycle or um, just anything, but I really don't want to say a golf cart. So then he plans, okay, I can get down there with no electronic data, golf cart, 
leave my phone at home, do it, tear ass back to the house. He took 283 steps in like a minute. You got to think that's him getting the guns and the clothes and everything ready. He's making calls to put himself back at the house. He calls Maggie, he texts Maggie, and then he can, I think he thought probably to himself, I can get the alibi and getting rid of the guns and the clothes I was wearing all done in one shot. All of the cases that he worked on, the car accidents and stuff, getting the OnStar electronic car data and using cell phone data is really was his, that's what he used and that's what he in a way became an expert in and so it's no coincidence that that has became or that became the crux of his plan and he was a little bit too urgent to have the law enforcement look up the car data. Yeah, look up the cell phone data. It works out. I promise you, just please look up the car data. And so he then floors the car to his mom's house, probably stashes the guns and his clothes in a swamp, I would say. He probably buried him in a swamp or hid him temporarily. And because at that time, at the beginning, his gauge of power, authority, and benefit of the doubt was full. He had months to move him somewhere else or maybe just buried him in a swamp at his parents' house. Um, they'll probably be found in 50 years by some metal detector enthusiast. Murdoch, murder weapons found. And the metal detector enthusiast will be on the front page of the paper posing proudly with their metal detector with the rusted guns out in front of them. But he got rid of his clothes and his guns, which is not easy to do, right? That's, that's pretty hard to g get away with. Again, he has the, all of the power and authority and benefit of the doubt, so that helped him, but that's one of the things of his plan that went pretty well is they couldn't find those murder weapons. So he does whatever he does there. He weirds out the home health care aide that takes care of his mom, and then he comes back. I've done a whole video on it. It's not easy to call 911 on yourself. It's got to sound realistic. You don't want to sound overbearing with trying to put in your story. So he calls 911. The first officer comes and um, screaming about a boat wreck. And then we're at the questioning that night at 1 in the morning. And so, like I said, he says, start at the top, take your time. And Alec, the first thing he wants to talk about is, you mean when I came back? I came back. Did I mention that I came back? And another thing that Alec does is he, he uses details like, I saw his brain, his... I saw my son's brain as a way to shut down questioning on hard parts. Like at one part, they go, what did you see when you walked up to Paul? And somebody that maybe would be helping the, the law enforcement figure out what happened would say, what did I see? Did I see anything weird? But what Alex says is blood. I saw blood as a way to back him off a little bit, like, all right, all right, let's change the subject. We don't want to, he's really having to talk about some horrible stuff. And so he's crying. This is at the beginning of that first questioning, so he's really turning on the crying. It's about ready to fade away. But he's saying that he saw his son's brain and that he goes, quote, I think I tried to turn Paul over. Um, uh his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try and do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife. And every time, even before the kennel video and everything came out and blew up his story and he admitted he was lying and was there and the whole thing, every time he talked about that phone popping out, it just sent... I just had alarms going off in my head. Like, no, no. Kind of like when Casey Anthony talks and you're just looking at her like, no, no, Casey, that didn't happen. Every time he talks, yeah, I went over to Flip Paul and his cell phone popped out and I picked it up and I thought, hey, maybe. But then I thought, no, maybe. And I put it back down. And it's, I wonder what, we'll probably never know. I wonder what he thought 
he was going to do? Did he know that possibly Paul videoed or did he think that he could read the text message? Because even if the screen's locked, a lot of times you can read text messages. So did he want to look to see if if Roro had text him or what was up with that? Or did he want to see if maybe he could unlock it? Or did he think, I'm going to get rid of Paul's phone? But then after he picked it up and was holding it, realized that is not a good idea and put it back in. It would be really interesting to hear what he thought he might do in that second when he picked up Paul's phone and then realized it's going to look too incriminating and he puts it back. Another thing I was wondering about is once he gets back to the property that night from being at his his mom's house that drive back he knows once he gets back to the property it is showtime you got to call 911 pull that performance off then the cops get there you got to pull that performance off then you're in the interrogation with the camera right in your face you got to pull that off i wonder what alec was doing on that trip back was it a half an hour or whatever it was was he practicing crying <laughs> no it's not oh. <laughs> or was he just staring dead eye at the road knowing what he had to do it's interesting to think because it's a that's a lot to it's almost the easy part driving there you bury the guns you talk to the home health home health aid once he's back he has to act and pretend and paint the picture for a long time, for months. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So to know that whole thing is about to start as soon as you get back on the property, it would be interesting to know what his mindset was on the way back. And he was making phone calls to try to make the whole thing sound realistic. I called my lawyer friend Steve and talked to him. So maybe that's how he was getting through that time because it's a that's a lot of pressure that you know right when I get back the whole it is show time and I got to pull it off and my whole life is on the line so he's talking about that the cell phone popped out and whenever they ask him well what do you mean when you say the cell phone popped out and and you picked it up and thought maybe and then his answer is always something like I just I it hit me that I didn't want to mess anything up on the scene he never answers what that, and I thought maybe, what that maybe was. And the same strategy that he used in the court case when he was uh, saying papa, he makes sure to always refer to Maggie as my wife, my wife. There's no way I would kill Maggie because she is my wife, and I'm going to call her my wife. And he calls her my son and my boy. And kind of a funny part is he's saying, Right when I got back, I called 911. I talked to the dispatcher. She was very good. He, he rates the, as if he's the boss of the whole system in that town. He goes, she was very good. It's like no one asked you what, what your rating of the 911 dispatcher is, Alec. She was very good. And then so he says, the interrogator says, what made you come down here tonight? And Alex's answer is, my mom has late-stage Alzheimer's. That's another detail that he uses to get sympathy. He says it to anyone that'll listen. My mother has late-stage Alzheimer's. Did I mention her late-stage Alzheimer's? My mother, Alzheimer's, late-stage, full late-stage. And so he goes, my mother has late-stage Alzheimer's. I went to check on her. I went to check on my parents, and then here is word for word. This is maybe five to seven minutes in that first questioning. This is the first time that he says the whole story that he's hoping desperately that he go with. So he says, quote, Maggie was the dog lover. She fools with the dogs. Again, how you can follow pretty easily his thought process and see his plan in a roundabout way. The fact that he says Maggie was the dog lover, she fools with the dogs. I think when he's planning it months before that, he thought, okay, she goes to the kennel. That's perfect. I'll make it look like I'm home. I'll take the golf car and she'll be at the kennel. It's, I don't think it's a coincidence. That's a, one of the first little stories that he tells. He likes to 
do a little story like Maggie was the dog lover. She likes to fool with the dogs and then a, li a quick lie right behind it. So she he goes, Maggie was the dog lover. She likes to fools with the dogs. I knew she'd be at the kennel. I was at the house. Just that quick, this whole little story about Maggie's a dog lover and then slip it in. I was at the house. That's set in stone. Don't question that. I left the house to go to my mom's. I tried to call her when I left texted her, no response. Um, when I got back to the house, there's obviously nobody in there. So I figured they were still up here fooling around. Paul was going to be getting set up to plant our sunflowers. This would have been a great time for a stress poop in the sunflowers. Going to plant our sunflowers. They got sprayed and died. He was refiguring to do to plant the sunflower seeds. So I came back up here and drove up and saw and called and he always quickly says I and called and I called right away because we all know the longer you wait to call 911 if you putz around you start to look really guilty and he knows that from being in a lifetime dynasty of legal prosecutors that that is the case so he always adds that in and then I called and Working on the sunflowers at 10 at night when it's pitch black is not really realistic. And then he, the interrogator asks, how was your relationship with Mags and Paul? And he said at the court case, the reason he lied and said that I wasn't at the murder scene, but I actually was, was it made him nervous when the interrogator asked what his relationship was like with Maggie. He tried to make it sound when he was up on the stand, that really threw me off when he asked what my relationship was. I got scared, so I didn't want to be at the scene, so I lied. But as I had already said, he had already started with that lie. Um, like when I came back, is that where you want to start? When I came back? You don't want to start any earlier, right, than that. Let's just start with when I came back and I was not here. So that kind of gets blown up. And then... The interrogator asks, have you guys had any trespassers, anything like that? And here we go again with the boat wreck story. He goes, the only thing I can think of is there was a boat wreck, and Paul has been getting these threats, and the two, they ask him, like, what kind of threats? And they both sound like terrible lines from B-movies. You could tell Alec is making it up on the spot, and he goes, yeah, people come up to him and say, Hey, I'm going to kick your ass. Or he goes, you tell me who was driving that boat, you little son of a bitch. The, no one said that, right? I, I definitely think people did say things to Paul when he was out at bars and stuff. But hearing what if Alec wrote the whole movie and the whole scene... You tell me who was driving that boat, you little son of a bitch. And it's funny that he is still pretending like it's even a question that Paul wasn't driving the boat. Even at, during these interrogations, when that's totally absurd. And that's why he needed to get this whole thing done before the boat wreck lawsuit and criminal case started. Because... Their whole thing was, yeah, maybe, maybe Paul wasn't driving. Maybe it was Connor. I showed up with my assistant deputy. I'm Alec. I'm the assistant deputy with his badge on his belt saying, no, no one say who was driving. Connor, I think maybe you were driving and they kept up that charade of no one really knows who's driving. But the reason that's totally absurd is there was like 10 other people on the boat None of them were blackout drunk the way that Paul was, and they all were begging Paul to let anyone else drive the boat. It wasn't like everybody was having fun and carrying on, and no one was even really paying attention to who was driving. That was the whole focus before the boat wreck even happened is, Paul, you're too drunk. Let someone else drive, please. No one else drives my boat. And that the boat wreck lawsuits would have been millions of dollars that they didn't have. And so, but this questioning when he's going, all right, well, do you have any trespassers? He goes, the only thing I can think of is there's this boat wreck and Paul was receiving all these threats. And then the interrogators are going, 
all right, well, are any of the, were these threats on social media or were they people that Paul knew or were they people that were actually on the boat? And Alec knows that, no, you know, none of them are in writing and none of, he doesn't, it's kind of a waste to try to make it seem like it was people on the boat that did this because they could easily, he knows it wasn't them. And so he knows with an investigation, they're all going to have alibis and electronic data and it, they're not going to be put here. So what Alec has to make it seem like is, nah, it wasn't anybody on, so it, none of them were in writing or anything. It was all like out in public, people he didn't know. It wasn't anybody that you guys can investigate or exhaust the possibilities that they did it. It was all people that, it was, it was vigilantes. You know how it goes. It was just the random vigilantes. And so he's going, they're going, none of it was in writing on social media. No, it was more just out where people were saying, you tell me who was driving, you little son of a bitch. And they go, is there anybody you can think of? And in one of the most messed up moments, he goes, there... Alec talks about there's this guy working for, for me. His name was C.B. Rowe. And I think Alec knows that they're, they're going to look into him and there's going to be evidence that proves that it's not him. But even to throw his, just this worker that he had taken care of his property, to throw him in the suspect mix and the way Alex talks about it, he goes... This is so stupid that I'm almost embarrassed to tell you about it. Again, this is one in the morning on the night it happened, and he's talking about this guy that works for him, and he's going, I got a guy that works for me. And he told Paul a story that he got into a fight with a black guy in high school, and then undercover agents saw that fight, and they said they came and took him and they said that was a really good fight we're gonna put a team together with navy seals and we're gonna put you on it and you're gonna take down radical black panthers with this team of navy seals and your fighting skills that we witnessed and that alec chose to say that going back to the things that he decides to say and when he says says them that's crazy to say on the night. Think about someone that actually wanted to figure out what happened to the family. And all of a sudden he's trying to point, point them and he keeps ending every sentence like that. Like, I don't think it was him, but I just think that that's crazy. And I know you guys got to look into it. And what's totally psycho about that is you just get this feeling that if in some bizarre world, say they go and do investigate C.B. Rowe, his innocent farmhand that works hard on the property, say for whatever reason there was a little evidence or the case started going towards him and he gets arrested, you just know Alec wouldn't have said anything. He would have let that guy go to jail forever. Of course, there was no evidence putting C.B. Rowe anywhere near the scene of the crime or anything. But it's kind of like a Jesse Smollett. If a cop would have pulled up right when he, those ki the friends were fake beating him up and got arrested, you just know Jesse wouldn't have said, no, 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 no that's it. Don't, don't arrest. The, it's, it's all fake. He would have sat there and let them go down. And I think Alec would have easily, with a clean, blank space where a conscious is supposed to be, let him go down for it, which is incredibly scary. All right, then they go back to the boat incident and oh, kind of weird wording. The interrogator goes, was there anyone on that boat that had a hard on for Paul? And Alec goes, there was some yip yap at the beginning. It's like, Alec, what, what, what's yip yap? Like saying things that are true, like Paul is dangerous. Paul is out of control. Paul is a brooding, abusive drunk boyfriend a, a, kind of an epiphany that I had is it doesn't help to get kids out of trouble because before the boat wreck ha happened almost the exact same scene where Paul and his cool girlfriend leave a place Paul's hammered drunk his girlfriend goes you should let me drive I'm not that drunk you're really drunk and Paul goes no one's driving my truck but me and he gets in immediately the they get on 
the first exit he takes, he rolls the truck into the ditch. They get out. Picture you're the girlfriend. It's a dark, creepy, rural road. You just got into a rollover car accident. The car's making the horrifying hissing and clicking sounds of a wrecked car. You're thinking, oh my God, I'm safe. She pulls out her phone to call 911. Paul grabs her phone. What are you doing? Hangs up, throws the phone into the forest. And then Paul, like he always does, he called his grandfather, who was the longest running prosecutor in the country. And and his grandfather calls Alec and Maggie, and they all meet him out there on the dark rural road. And the girlfriend said that the grandfather and Paul Alec and Maggie start immediately, systematically, and almost professionally cleaning out the car, cleaning the beer cans out, taking the guns out of the truck. Sounds like the whole thing had a creepy, industrious quality to it. Imagine you're just standing there. Maggie scolded her for calling 911. But if they would have just let Paul get a DUI at that point, pretty much the exact same scene as the boat wreck, where people are begging him not to drive, you're too drunk, he's all just brooded out at that point. And if they would have let him get a DUI and slog his way through the DUI system, he maybe would have learned his lesson, which maybe would have led to him not doing the boat wreck, which maybe would have led to Mallory not dying, which probably would have made it so Alec could navigate the financial crimes without killing him because the boat wreck was kind of the topper of, you know, it's over. This family is over. It's Things are going to change, and I'm going to shield Maggie and Paul from those tough changes. And so, and those are just the two things you got to, those are the two things that made national news, the car accident that they covered for him for, and then the boat wreck. You got to think Paul at least got away with something. And so by letting, by letting him get out of that one, it moved it on to the next one, and it got worse, and then all of a sudden someone's dead. So pretty scary stuff thinking about him that night, Paul and Maggie and the grandpa, they're cleaning the scene and everything. And um, then they talk about the gun that Alex went and got. And he was like, I told the 911 operator, remember the one that he goes, she was really good. I approve of her performance tonight. And um, all right, we're going to keep moving. At this point, they ask Alec, all right, can you make a list of all of the guns? And he goes, yeah, I can do that. I'm not going to do it now, but yes, I can do that. The only thing that really changes from this first questioning at one in the morning to the second one three days later is that the type of bullet that came back that was used. And so the hardest part for Alec in that second one three days later is they ask Alec, what kind of gun did Paul shoot hogs with? And Alec doesn't want to say 300 blackout. It's just too much of a coincidence that the one gun their family kind of lost or maybe it got stolen or maybe space aliens sucked it up was the same gun. And so he's going, oh, they shoot Buster. He he would use Buster's gun and it it, it was a 300 blackout. And I heard that that was the gun that was used, which I wonder who told Alec, someone in in the law enforcement reached out to Alec to told him that because the investigator hadn't told him yet. But we'll stick on this first one, the first questioning that was at one in the morning. And then they ask him, uh, is there any cameras on the property? And he's so dismissive of no, that it seems suspicious. He's going, no, we we got a bunch of deer cameras that are out um, on deer stands for hunting. And they go, oh, well, are, are any of them pointed at that area and he goes no none of them are at that area no need to even check them whereas if you came back onto your big property and your family was murdered and you think on just unarmed vigilantes that came that were going to find guns and kill your family and then disappear into the night you would probably think we should check those deer cameras what if that's the direction that they went but he's like no 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 cameras then are that would see anything. No need to even look. Don't worry about it. And um, 
And then they, they kind of just sit there. It's pushing two in the morning. And then he's like, all right, well, I don't have any other questions. We're going to want to talk to you again. And then in the second interrogation, three days later, they pile into the car again. What's interesting is both parties went home to figure out, okay, where should I ask more questions about? And I think Alec thought, okay, what do I need to make sound realistic? What did what sounded a little fake in that first one? And hilariously, I think Alec thought me just being at the house when these vigilantes not only show up but find guns, murder my family, and then leave, the fact that I didn't see anything or feel the commotion at all is a little bit unrealistic. So he adds in something that he didn't add on that first night. He adds in, as I was laying there napping, I could have swore I heard Maggie and Paul pull up which he's trying to make sound like that must have been the vigilantes. They must have pulled up. And then even funnier, he said when he left and he was going to go to his mom's place, that there, there's a, cat, a house cat that turned wild that was running around the property. And he said that I saw something run and scamper off, and I thought it was the cat, but I don't know, saying maybe that was one of them. And it's like, now are you saying that maybe the five foot two vigilantes, they ran on all fours? That's even scarier. And like I said, they asked him to list the guns again. And he asked that that's for the first time. He has to say, yeah, that one gun that we lost is a 300 blackout. And if you're a homicide detective, that is going to be the first direction you go is wait a second. The first information we had come back is that 300 blackout was used. They have all these family guns, and the one that is mysteriously missing is the same. Boom, that's the direction we're going. And then another thing he asked in that second one, he goes, what's the biggest argument that you and Maggie have? And just think, financially, he was totally tanking. He was at 40 oxys a day, a complete and total liar in every way, full of deception. And he said, after all that, you could think about, Maggie was ready to leave him. Think about the arguments that they had for all of that. He had been a vicious addict for 20 years. And the biggest argument that he said they have was, Maggie wishes me and the boys would spend more time with the in-laws. That is not believable. That's almost like a 90s sitcom, The Murdochs. We need to spend more time with the in-laws. No way, toots. You know me and the boys don't like to hang out with the in-laws. Oh, Alec. Like, it's just with where their life was to say that's our biggest argument. She wants to hang out with her parents, and I don't, we don't feel like it. And other than that, we don't even fight whatsoever. Totally unrealistic. And so... Those are pretty much the first two questionings, the night of, three days later, and then two months go by. And everything in those two months comes back Alec. And so when they bring him back in, the whole vibe has changed. I'm going to do a video on that interrogation, so I'm going to cut it off here. I love you all. I'll see you next time. Why, Stive and why, Shamita was taking pills.